Uh, this is the first sermon in a series of sermons that I'll be doing. If, if you're a member here and you didn't realize there's a sermon series coming up, well, I don't know what to say because I've been uh, talking about it. I've been putting up flyers, all sorts of stuff. And we're going to be doing a, a nine lesson sermon series extending from today. I'll speak every first uh, I'll speak every Sunday morning and afternoon for the next five Sundays, including today. And there will be one Wednesday night in there through the first week of October. And we're going to be talking about what is the gospel. I call it the gospel series. Not every sermon will be answering this question exactly, precisely what is the gospel. We'll, we'll answer that this morning and to follow up tonight on this. But uh, every sermon in the series will have to do somehow with that theme. And I believe by the time we're done, Lord willing, we'll have a better understanding not only what this message is, but uh, about other things biblically, how we should understand God's grace, how we should understand our faith toward God, how we should understand our works and what role those have in this gospel scheme of redemption. Um, before we get going, I wanted to just, I don't usually do this reading in between, but I wanted to tell you about this right here. This is a folder and I've made 50 of these and what I want this to be throughout the next five weeks is I want this to be a learning experience. And sometimes we pray in the closing prayer. In fact, listen today. See if somebody prays this in the closing prayer. They probably won't now. Lord, help us to take this message home and to study it for ourselves and apply it to our life. And how many times has God looked down from the heavens and he sees you the next six days and you never take that message home, you never study it and you never apply it to your life. How many times does he do that? And so I've given you no excuse on the day of judgment for the next five weeks because I've made a folder for every sermon that I'm going to give. I've only got materials for the first two lessons and each, each sermon, each Sunday, sorry, I'll give you materials for the two lessons I'm giving that Sunday. And it will include an uh, outline for each sermon. So you'll have the sermon outline that I'm giving you. Uh, you'll have it in a, uh, a visual format as well. Some of you guys are visual learners. And I'm trying to reach the most people that I possibly can with this. Uh, there will be a quiz in there, and you can take the quiz home and answer the questions on the quiz. And then on Wednesday, you can bring that back to me, and I'll grade it for you. And we can, if you want you know, some explanations, I'm not giving you a letter grade through this. Don't worry. It's not high school. We're not university here. I'm just wanting to uh, give you the best learning experience that you can truly understand by the end of this, what is the gospel? And I also have some handouts in there that will help visualize some of the key concepts I want you to take away, and it will include more information that I'm not going to share in the pulpit. Because if I shared with you everything that you know I've been studying, of course, we'd be here for more than nine lessons. And uh, take that binder, and by the time you're done, you'll have a thick binder of uh, homework that you can take along with you throughout the study. Now, I wanted to say all that so we could get it out of the way before we really got into the study and we can focus less on the homework now and more on the message of God's word. I want us to be like uh, the Bereans and be more fair-mounted like the Thessalonians. Acts, I think it was 17 says about these, these people who Paul preached to. And we can uh, truly learn and assess ourselves. Have we obeyed the gospel? Do I even know what I obeyed 10 years ago, 20 years ago? And when I go encourage somebody to make the confession, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, do they actually understand what they're confessing? Those are key questions that we'll broach this morning. Before we go into that, let's go to God, our Father in heaven, in prayer. The word gospel is used in many different contexts and ways today. Uh, we call events like we just had last weekend, gospel meetings. Sometimes we'll, Lawrenceburg is the home of Southern gospel music. We'll call music that we're listening to gospel music. And a lot of people will take the word gospel and they'll attach it to their product, whatever it is, and it sells because of the values that are tied to that phrase. It's much like, I don't know if you pay attention, but there is a coffee company that several members here buy coffee from. Uh, I think John got, a kick, uh, got everybody on this kick. And they sell coffee by putting guns and American flags on their coffee bag. And I don't know what either one of those have anything to do with the quality of coffee or about coffee, but it sells. And there are other coffee companies I have looked up and found that they also sell their product by plastering a gun and an American flag on it. People don't really care about the coffee. They just trust it because of the values attached by that symbol. And so a lot of people do the same thing with the word gospel. You put it on a product and it sells. Or you say, I'm going to give a gospel sermon and it has nothing to do with the gospel, but yet people will listen with avid attention. 
And so you can think of how we use the phrase in superficial ways, meaningless ways, that when somebody finally asks you, I asked a man yesterday, what is the gospel? He said, I don't know. I asked, uh, I gave a very short version of this at the 4th of July meeting in Springfield, Missouri, and I asked a young man, I said, what is the gospel? He said, I don't know. Sometimes I'll ask people what's the gospel, and they'll give an answer, but they obviously, from looking at their face, they're not confident when they answer the question. And they certainly didn't use any scripture when they answered the question. And maybe you this morning, you're thinking about this now that I've used a couple of examples, and you say, I don't know. And I definitely couldn't give a scripture. There's about three answers that I'll put up here on the slides um, that I'll call the popular gospel. Now, there are some kernels of truth within these statements. In fact, the first one you're going to think, Aaron, what's wrong with that? But listen along as we go through this study. And I'm not saying that there's, it's completely wrong. I'm just saying that these answers, perhaps they short circuit the best answer or maybe what the, what the Bible's trying to put our attention on when it talks about the gospel. The first answer people will give, this is probably the most common. The gospel is the fact that Christ came and died for my sins so that I could be saved. That's the one I'm, you read that and you're thinking, what, what's wrong about that? Well, again, there's a lot of truth to that, but uh, I would say it's an incomplete answer and it puts the attention perhaps on the wrong part of the gospel message. Okay. We'll bear that out further. Another common answer. People say the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection. And now you could turn to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 5, and Paul pretty much just says it just like that. So very true answer. But I don't think people quite understand what Paul understood when he said, it's the death, burial, and resurrection. I get that impression. When people say that, it just kind of flows off their tongue with very little meaning. You get the idea? Another thing, now people don't typically say the gospel is H-B-R-C-B-A-P. Now if you, didn't, if you weren't raised in the Church of Christ... And you don't have a clue maybe what that refers to. But at the end of most Church of Christ sermons, somebody will say, now if you haven't heard, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized, and they'll say it about that quickly. They might go give them some scripture to it. Then you need to do that. Come forward while we stand and sing. I've done that many times. I'm not making fun of anybody. If you've been raised in the church, you know what they're talking about. But at the same time, do you equate that with the gospel? If you do, now I would say, that's wrong. <laughs> the first two, there's some truth to them. That one, that's not the gospel, okay? These are popular answers people give. We might use it in meaningless ways, the phrase, but let's get down to what is the gospel. It comes from a Greek phrase, and we're not going to get into the original languages of the Bible very much in this five-week study because uh, neither of us can handle it. But it does come from a Greek phrase, euangelion. Maybe you've heard of that. And that is, in its barest, most root definition, simply good news. And so you hear people say, the good news of Jesus Christ, that's the gospel. Okay? Um, this phrase, sometimes we might think of it in our modern context. I remember when I was a kid, and uh, the good news was when dad would come in on Sunday. And I remember this one Sunday. I can't remember exactly how old I was, probably 10 years old, and he would say, good news. And we all listened with rapt attention, you know. What is it? And he said, we're having steak tonight. I thought, ooh, man. Because, see, we didn't have steak, but maybe once a year. Sirloin steak. I didn't know back then that was the cheapest steak you could possibly get. To me, it was ribeye. It was uh, filet mignon. But all we knew is we were getting steak tonight, and that was good news. Now, in, in a way, in a primitive way, the gospel message of Jesus Christ is that type of good news. It's news that brings joy to you. But it's really more than that. It's really not quite just a, a good news statement like that. And in other ways, it's like a proclamation, really. It's a proclamation of really event-altering news. And it's, it was used in the Roman world just like it was used in the Bible world. It was, uh, this is a Greek word, the people spoke Greek. And so we can look at the culture of the Greek world or the Roman world that spoke Greek and we can identify some parallels. And one parallel I found interesting recently, it was brought to my attention by another preacher is uh, there was an inscription in the days of Augustus Caesar about Augustus Caesar. He was the son of Julius Caesar, and he had a birthday. And it was called, this inscription is called the Priene Inscription. I think I'm saying that correctly. And I'll put it up here. Read it with me. It says, uh, this, now this is from Craig Evans, a Bible scholar. Uh, he's cited on Wikipedia. It says, the Priene calendar inscription is an inscription in stone recovered at Priene, uh, an ancient Greek city cited in western Turkey that uses the term gospel in referring to Augustus Caesar. 
It's called the Priana Calendar Inscription because it refers to the birthday of Augustus Caesar as the beginning of an era, the beginning of the gospel according, uh, announcing his kingdom that heralded peace and salvation for his people. Now, that was a mouthful, but maybe you're like me. The first time you read that, you start reading and you start forgetting that you're reading a Wikipedia source about Augustus Caesar and you are not reading the Bible about Jesus Christ because the very last part of that sounds very much like the first chapter of Mark's gospel and the, first, the third chapter of Matthew's gospel. Uh, the word gospel was actually talking here about Augustus Caesar, the beginning of an era, the beginning of the gospel announcing his kingdom that heralded peace and salvation for everyone in the kingdom. And this is more than just we're having steak for dinner tonight. This was this is a life-altering kingdom announcement. There is a new king in town, and anybody in his kingdom will enjoy the benefits. This is idealistic. Will enjoy these benefits, salvation and peace. Well, I would put forth to you that, that that's what we're going to identify. That's what we're going to see the phrase used in relation to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not just good news. It's a proclamation of a king in his kingdom. I would put this forth to you by looking at these passages right here. Uh, these are several places where the Apostle Paul, he talks about the gospel, the good news of Christ. And he uses that possessive. And this good news message is a good news message. Not only is it Jesus' message, like he owns it, but it's about him. And it is key information announcing something about who he is. It's not just a, a message about how to get saved. That's HBRCVAP. It's not a message about how to get saved. It's the message that you then respond to in being saved. And as we go on, I'm going to follow this roadmap here so you can follow along with me. We're going to look at several, we're going to look at five main plain gospel texts. And these are plain texts because four of them just simply say the gospel and then give you an explanation. I mean, you can't get more plain than that. The Bible does that several places. We're going to look at five gospel texts to make plain to us what this message is. And I think the, it's a good strategy to look at the plain text. And that will give you a straight shot. And next we're going to look at a way to summarize the message that, in a way that we can understand. I've tried to do that in the past. And I think I've failed. And I've been tweaking it endlessly. And I think I've got one that even the little kids can remember. And after we, as we do that, we're going to identify what I believe is the climax of the gospel. The part that is emphasized... That should be emphasized when we are asking people to respond to it. And then finally, we'll compare and contrast what pop, popular gospel messages that are preached, how they line up with the biblical gospel message. And we'll conclude. Okay, so let's get right into these five explicit gospel texts, as I call them. And, and what we'll do is we'll read the passage, and, and it's going to be kind of small. I realize some of you in the back won't be able to read this. Uh, these verses will be on your outline in your folder. You can turn with them if you like in your Bible. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 15 is the first passage. And as you're turning there, if you can't read this, um, I'll just say this. This passage right here is kind of primitive. There's only two feature facts about the gospel in this passage. Now, I think passages like this are probably the most helpful because that's God summarizing the message in about two feature facts. What would, what would Jesus include? What would Matthew or Mark include if they were summarizing it, inspired by the Holy Spirit? And so it says, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, Mark 1, verses 14 through 15. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. He summarizes as the gospel of the kingdom of God, the rule of God. In this context is what that means. And it is in the fulfillment of prophecy. Now, as we keep on reading, we're going to read other plain texts that add more feature facts to this message. Those are not going to contradict what we just read here. They're going to complement it. And they're going to give us more information. But what you'll see is some underlying repeated elements. And so I'll read the passage and then we'll put the gospel feature facts to the right of the passage. The next passage, we'll move on, uh, is Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through Four really is what I'm going to read. Uh, I have verse five up there, but it's uh, we're not going to read that. Romans chapter one verses one through four. Now this is my favorite, uh, and this is 
really wasn't my favorite passage in, in going to and explain what is the gospel before I started studying this, but it's really my favorite. It's probably the most, I believe, informative of all the explanations Paul gives of what this message is. He says in Romans 1, verses 1 through 4, and I'm reading from the New King James, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, there it is, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now that's a lot. And it's hard to process that by just reading it one time through. You got to read it through several times. But what I, if you'll trust me here and then you go home like a good Berean and you study this for yourself, you'll hopefully find that I'm not leaving anything off here. There's six feature facts here Paul gives us about the gospel. He uh, says this is again in fulfillment of prophecy. Well, we read that in the last passage. He uh, calls Jesus the, the Christ, Lord, the Son of David, and the Son of God all in this these verses. Those are four different titles used to describe Jesus. I count that as one feature fact. His name. Uh, it says that he was confirmed by the power of the Spirit. I believe that means after his resurrection, the fact that he is actually alive from the dead was confirmed by miracles. And uh, that was to prove that he resurrected. Point number four. All he says that he was born of the seed of David. That means he was incarnated. This was actually God in the flesh. Yes, it was. He was incarnated, and yes, he did die. It wasn't just a mirage. This resurrection was not just a feel-good story. It was actually resurrection from death. These are six facts that Paul tells us that are central to this message that saves, okay? A uh, third passage we're going to go to. This is the one that probably most people think of. When, if they're thinking of a scripture, it's probably 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 5. And this is the one that I always thought of before. And it's a good passage, obviously. It's the Word of God. But I'm putting forth to you that though there are obviously truths in this passage, perhaps people don't understand everything that Paul understood in this original context. Verse 1, it says, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you. And then we're going to jump down to verse 3. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received... That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. That's the only passage in the whole New Testament that I have found where the gospel is summarized as simply the death, burial, and resurrection. That was news to me. I just, I just assumed that it was mentioned several times in that formula, but really, that's the only place in the whole New Testament. Did you know that? Uh, but what we find out is more than it's just the death, burial, and resurrection. Really, he says six things. He calls Jesus the Christ, which is an important title, by the way. The titles Christ, Lord, Son of God, Son of David all have significant meaning to them. And you need to know what it means when you confess that. We're going to talk about those titles this afternoon, so come back. Come back. Okay, that's a teaser. But he calls him the Christ. He then says he died for our sins. He fulfilled Scripture. He was buried. He resurrected on the third day. And this miraculous resurrection was witnessed by many witnesses, over 250. Okay? That's the, the third passage. Let's go to the fourth one. This is a pretty short one. This is one people typically don't think of, maybe ever. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8. It says there, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Straightforward. He was raised from the dead according to the gospel. There's three facts here. He's called Christ. He's called the seed of David. He resurrected from the dead. And then finally, we'll look at the fifth plain text, and we'll be done with this part of the study. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 5. Now, this one does not say the gospel. The word euangelion is never used in this passage. But once you read this, you, you see this is clearly a straightforward explanation of the gospel and the scheme of redemption. Paul says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. We learn another key element here, really five, that he, Jesus was sent by God. He was the son of God. Again, he was incarnated. He was sent for the purpose to redeem. And in the process, he adopted us as sons of God, those that would submit themselves to him. Not every human being. 
In one sense, every human being is the son of God. They're his creation. But in another sense, only those that have submitted themselves to him are adopted sons of God in a special sense. So these are the five passages that we can read, and they're plain, and they each tell us something. Now, if we take all these, on the next slide, I'm going to show you 11 facts. that we, If we take all these verses together and we cram them into one slide, here's the 11 facts. Now, there's really, we read more than 11 facts, but some of them have shared categories. And so I, I put the, the ones that had shared meaning in the same group and boiled it down to 11 facts. So here we go. The 11 facts that we just learned about Jesus' gospel is that he is the Christ, son of David, son of God, the Lord. He fulfilled scripture, prophecy. He was sent by God. He took on flesh. He died. He was buried. He resurrected. His resurrection was witnessed by many witnesses. That was also confirmed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he reigns as king, destroying the power of sin. We learned all those things in one way or another. And in just a minute, we're going to summarize that in a fashion that I believe that you can remember. Because in the past, I've basically just taken those, put it into a sentence, and said, remember that. And I remembered it, but I had to work hard at it. And I know that if you didn't work hard at it, you probably weren't going to remember it. Well, you know, I'll say this, too. Anybody might make a list. And what I read to you, those five passages are not the only five passages that give us features of the gospel. Those are what I would call the five plainest passages. But somebody might come up with a list of 14 facts. Somebody might come up with a list of nine. Say, I was a little bit too wordy. And you're not going to, you might come up with a couple of people that circumstantially came up with the same list. But the point is that this is really a story about Jesus. I'm giving myself away here. And so the story includes everything about Jesus. <laughs> And so you got to boil it down to what is the central point of the gospel? That's what we want to talk about now. What's the central point of the gospel? And I believe the central point is Christ's enthronement, but I got to prove that to you. Okay. I can't just say that. I've got to prove that to you from scripture. The reason I believe that in this message, the fact that Jesus Christ reigns right now as a result of everything we just read is the central point is because of a, a couple of really easy things to spot when you think about it. Uh, it, the, we looked at this already, but in the, all these verses, Paul says that the gospel is the gospel of Christ. Now, I'm going to give you one of those titles, meanings that we're going to study further this evening, and that's the name Christ. I've said this before. Some of you have heard it. The word Christ in the Greek simply means the anointed one. And in the Old Testament, in the Bible, people were anointed to several different offices. But specifically, when Jesus was anointed at his baptism in Matthew chapter 3, Mark chapter 1... He was anointed as the king. And he didn't officially take on ruling officially on his throne until his resurrection and ascension. But when he was anointed at his baptism, he was anointed as the king of Israel. And whenever you see the gospel of Christ, that is really saying the gospel of the anointed king. And it summarizes it in so simple a way. That's telling me that the central message of this gospel, the climax, is the fact that Jesus is on his throne ruling. That's what people should remember. If nothing else, remember it all. But if nothing else, remember that. Another thing is that we read this already, but there are three passages here in the gospel of Matthew that call the gospel the gospel of the kingdom. Well, that makes sense because it's the gospel of the king and his kingdom that he rules over. And so both of these bring attention to Jesus ruling. And then finally, there's a gospel sermon in Acts chapter 13, which we're not going to read. In Acts chapter 13, verses 25 to 41, but you can turn to Acts chapter 2 because we are going to read something from there in a second. In Acts chapter 13, verses 25 to 41, Paul gives a gospel sermon. And what is very helpful is to go through the book of Acts. And I haven't done this with every sermon, but it would be good to go through the book of Acts and to look at all these gospel sermons that Paul and Peter and others give. Stephen... And pay attention to where their sermon climaxes and where you can imagine they get loud <laughs> and they bang on the pulpit and wake you up. Where does that happen in their sermon? Well, in Acts chapter 13, that happens when Paul quotes Psalm chapter 2, which is a royal psalm. And you know why it's called a royal psalm? It's because this psalm was read about the coming Messiah and he was a royal figure and he was a king. And Paul reads that, says he was, he is... You are today, you are my only begotten. And Paul says, and the prophet was speaking about Jesus Christ. 
And that's fulfilled today. And that was the, the loud part of the sermon <laughs> where he banged on the pulpit. The loud part of Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2, same thing. Read with me. We're going to start at verse 14. Or no, we're not going to start at verse 14. We're going to, the sermon starts at verse 14, but we're going to start at verse 30. And I wasn't going to read this originally, but I think this illustrates what we just said from Acts 13. Peter's preaching, not Paul. Therefore, brethren, I'm sorry, verse 30. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that's Christ, that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, I'm sorry, to David, a fruit of David's body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus, here we go, this Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, and this is a enthronement psalm, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and the anointed King, Christ. That's the climax of his message. And that's when people are pricked to the heart and they ask Peter, what do we need to do to be saved? Peter didn't have to say, now, HBRCBAP and anybody that wants to be known to him, come forward. They asked him, what do we got to do? Because this climactic point in the sermon demands a response. If Jesus is the ruling king, this is the gospel of the king and his kingdom, this has very serious implications to what I should be doing with my life. And we're going to bear that out throughout the rest of this, this study. And we're actually going to bear this point out, this third point about the, uh, the central element of this message being Christ and throne. But we're going to bear that out tonight when we talk about why was Jesus really killed. When you get down to the verdict, that should help us understand what the message really is about. Well, let's go back to summarizing this message. I said I would give you a short summary of it. And I think if any summary we give needs to summarize with the emphasis being on Christ's enthronement. And so that's what we've done. I'm going to give you a short and a long. Because maybe you won't remember the long. Um, People popularly say the gospel is that Christ came and died for my sins and I could be saved. Again, there's some truth to that, but it places the emphasis on the wrong part, I believe. You can remember it as the gospel is the good news that Jesus is the king. So if I ask any of you at the back door or maybe on Monday if I see you at Kroger or wherever, I say, hey, this is just a pop quiz. What's the gospel? I'm not uh, breathing down your neck, you know. If you don't get it the first time, I'll give you a break. But uh, you should be able to remember that, really. The gospel is the good news that Jesus is the king. That's the answer. The long answer, and if you can give me this one, man, I'll be impressed. The gospel is the good news that Jesus the Christ came in the flesh, died on the cross for our sins, was buried, resurrected, was seen by many witnesses, and confirmed by the power of the Holy Spirit after his resurrection and ascended into heaven to reign as king with all authority. And if you can give that answer, that's an impressive answer. That's the full answer that Paul gives in all those scriptures we read before. Now that's the message, the fact that Jesus is the king. Now let's take that message in the last part of this study and let's compare and contrast that with some of the popular renditions that you hear today commonly preached. Some of these you'll hear preached in churches of Christ. Some of these you'll hear preached more commonly in denominations. Um, I have three main points that I want to end with and I'll put them up here on the screen. The popular gospel that's often preached preached, misses submission and allegiance to Jesus as the king for self-centered marketing schemes, is what I think it does. And if you think about the gospel, the, the social gospel, you've heard that phrase before, I've said it many times in this pulpit, the social gospel is a marketing scheme. It's taking this good news message and it's saying, how can I market this like I market coffee? How can I market this like I market guns and political agendas? That's what it is. And because of that, there are some truths in the messages that this social gospel preaches, no doubt. Every good false doctrine has a kernel of truth. Every good one. And so you have to get past the truth and see where is their emphasis. Here's the problem with this gospel. The fact that Christ came and died for my sins 
so that I could be saved. Do you hear the, the me and the my's and the eyes about that? Where's the emphasis on that gospel message? The gospel message emphasis there is on the individual and on me. And how does this benefit me? And these social marketing agendas where churches go out preaching the gospel, they put some kernel of truth in there that Christ died, yes, but it's all about how does this benefit me? And when churches get into their inner sanctums and they start asking, how are we gonna advertise this event? They ask themselves, how can, what do people want? What do people need? What are their felt needs? And then they get together a sermon series or they get together some inflatable program uh, and then push that out to address people's needs and wants. In fact, the I believe it was, uh, I can't remember the preacher who wrote The Purpose Driven Life. I think it was Rick Warren. I be, if I'm not mistaken, I think Rick Warren did a survey years ago and he addressed uh, people's needs and wants and wishes when it came to a church. And if you ask most people, what are you looking for in a church? Most people will tell you, if they have kids, do you all have a good daycare center? Most people will tell you, do you have young kids there? Most people will tell you, do you have a fellowship hall and, and uh, events and stuff like that? That's what people want. 99% of the time when I ask people, uh, what are you looking for in a church or some variation of that? It's never about, what do you all teach? <laughs> How do you all worship? Do y'all have unity? <laughs> uh, none of these types of questions because that's not really what people are wanting and needing, at least according to their felt thoughts. And, you know, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the message that we just talked about, uh, don't get me wrong, it does address people's needs. And when you truly think about what you need, you'll want it and it will address your wants, but it should reprioritize those wants after you realize how depraved you really are. And it will not be as much about you and me, but it will be primarily, primarily. This is why those things have a place, but primarily it's about Jesus Christ and what the king wants and what his desires are. And when I ask, what are you looking for in a church? It should be, I'm looking for a church that pleases God. That should be the answer. And so what does that look like? Let's go to his word. Some manifestations of this. I was thinking, you know, how does this manifest itself besides what I've already said? Uh, in the way that people preach. One of the most famous mottos, and it was popularized really well by Billy Graham. He was a very powerful Southern go Baptist gospel preacher. And uh, I like listening to Billy Graham. He had some very powerful messages. But out of all the truth that he preached, he preached one very destructive thing over and over and over. And millions of people were so-called saved, but they weren't. Because he preached this one kernel of false doctrine. I mean, more than one probably. But the one was, have a personal relationship with Jesus. And people today still, in all sorts of different denominations, have this belief. Now, there is some truth to that. And I don't want you to walk away here thinking that when you become a Christian, there is no personal aspect to your relationship with God that you have entered into. That's why we're called sons of God. You're not just... A person you're not just a Christian you are a son of God it's a very personal relationship that you enter into so don't miss the, the truth for the motto what I'm saying is that when people when Billy Graham preached this message he meant more than just have a per well I don't know honestly that Billy Graham meant this this is just how people took it and ran with it people today mean more than just simply it's a personal relationship by that they mean here's a quote from cameron cole author of the gospel coalition i believe this is a i really don't know what denomination it's affiliated with um, when asked about this slogan he said one of the greatest benefits i received from my youth pastor was the critical observation that christianity is a relationship not a religion in the american south church attendance is a compulsory cultural behavior and what he's implying by all of that is that it's either a personal relationship with Jesus, me and Jesus. I think Randy Travis sings about me and God. It's either me and God or it's me and the church. There's none, there's none of this both, both and. It's a personal relationship and a relationship with his church. It's either rigid, lifeless, suck the spirit out of the building religion with compulsory commands. And you got to be there every Sunday and do this and that. Or it's this personal relationship with Jesus where it's me and God and we can sing about it going down the road, drinking our beer and doing whatever else that the country singers tell us to do. But there is a possibility where 
Not everything I just mentioned over there. But you can take both of those. It's a personal relationship with Jesus and his body. The local congregation here at Chapel Grove or wherever that local congregation exists. And within that, there's going to be rules because it's a gospel message about a king and his kingdom. And I don't know what you've ever understood from kingdoms in the history books, but there's rules and there's going to be some rules. But these rules will not break your back, not because they're not at times difficult, but because of what the king has done for you to begin with. He's not one of these kings that sits up high on a throne and asks you to do a whole bunch of this stuff, but it's not willing to do it himself. He's already done everything. And he's asking you to give him allegiance and to be faithful to him. But this personal relationship with Jesus stuff, it results in attitudes such as religion is bad, organized church is toxic, submission. There's a book called They Smell Like Sheep, and the author says the word submission is bone-breaking. It's a pretty good book overall, but that's one of the results of this attitude of personal relationship and getting away from any type of rules and religion is because submission as a concept is bone breaking. No, it's not. Submission to an evil master is bone breaking or to somebody that doesn't understand loving headship, but not Jesus Christ. Accountability to brothers and sisters in a local congregation of believers is not good. No, it is good. It is good. That's part of being in the kingdom. Number five, teaching from Scripture that Christ requires faithfulness in assembling with his people is legalistic. That's a big buzzword that we'll talk about in the last sermon of the series. Legalistic. It's rules. It's bad. And for all these reasons and more, it's most desirable for people to have a personal relationship with Jesus. But I would say that that version of the gospel is cheap. That version of the gospel um, doesn't cost you anything, really. And this version of the gospel is more focused on you than it is on Christ. That's why I, I don't buy this version of the gospel. Another one that I've heard Christians say um, where this manifests itself, this individualistic, self-centered gospel message manifests itself. When people say, now think about if you've ever said this, I want you, I want you to think and then say, I'm, I'm not going to say that anymore. Now, I, I'm giving you, you know, God's giving me a break here. At least I'm, I'm not God. But I believe that God understands that you didn't say this meaning it, okay? I truly believe that people say this without intention. It's referring to Christian life. It's all about going to heaven and taking as many people with you as you can. Now that's wrong. It's all about Jesus Christ and submitting to his lordship and spreading his glory throughout all the earth. And in the process, you'll get to heaven if you give him your faithfulness and trust in his grace. Okay? Stop saying that. It's all about going to heaven. No, it's not all about going to heaven. That's a small part of the scheme. But that's what people think because it's all about the self and it's all about the individual and me. Okay? The next thing, and the rest of the points won't be so long, but another thing that popular presentations of the gospel miss is that they can result in empty confessions, I do believe. People confessing Jesus as the Son of God with absolutely no clue what they're confessing when they stand there and make that confession the Ethiopian eunuch made. Now, I'd like you to think about Acts chapter 8. There, you know, when the eunuch, uh, Philip tells him in verse 37, if you believe with all your heart, you may. What is he talking about? The eunuch says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the confession he makes. That's the good confession that we talk about that Paul told Timothy to be faithful in. But did the eunuch understand what he was confessing? Of course, I believe that he did. I don't think Philip would have baptized him if he didn't understand what he was confessing. And uh, maybe it was because, you know, this eunuch, he was a very faithful proselyte. Somebody that was a Gentile but committed himself to the Jewish faith and had been going to the temple every year faithfully. He wasn't just some newbie off the street. Did he understand what he was confessing, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Now, when I say this, I'm not insinuating, don't mishear me. Do not mishear me. I'm not insinuating that you have to know everything there is to know about Jesus' personhood, what it means to be the Son of God, one of the most rich titles of Jesus in the whole Bible, and everything there is to know about the Christian faith before you get baptized. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, do you have a clue what it means? <laughs> if you don't have a clue what it means, then this is an empty confession. It means nothing. And I think my concern is that primitive regurgitations of the plan of salvation... And simply saying the gospel is the fact that Christ came and died for my sins so that I could be saved, they don't effectively communicate the awesome reign of Jesus Christ. 
And the fact that when I make that confession, and we're going to have a whole sermon just on confession. When I make that confession, I am giving allegiance to Christ, and I'm saying, I will follow you to the ends of the earth, and I will do whatever you ask of me. That's what you're saying, because that's what the title of Son of God it implies by its meaning. And so that's why another reason I think that traditional presentations of the gospel can be shortcoming. And then finally, I'll just leave you with this question. If a crucial and hallmark feature of the gospel message is the fact that Christ is enthroned and ruling and we're agreeing to submit to his sovereign rule, does this have any significant bearing on how we evaluate whether or not a young person, really any person, but I think especially young people, are ready to, as we call it, obey the gospel? And I think when you study this out further, the more I've studied this, the more I've become convinced that children probably don't understand as much as we say they understand when we say they understand because many adults don't understand what it means to become a member of the kingdom of God and to confess Jesus as the son of God and to actually bear the culpable responsibility of being a member of that kingdom. That's just a question I'll leave with you to munch on and you can think about it. I'm not going to bear that out anymore. In contrast to all that, when the gospel is properly understood, I do believe, there are contrasts to what we just read. We'll find that biblical gospel preaching emphasizes that Jesus is the king. He demands allegiance, and this message is not marketed to self-centered, serving individuals' interests. We'll find that biblical gospel preaching results in disciples confessing their allegiance to Jesus as the Son of God, with people actually understanding what they're confessing. And I do believe we'll find that the biblical gospel, properly presented as Jesus ruling over those who give allegiance to him, should have actual bearing on how we evaluate somebody's readiness to be baptized, no matter how old they are. Those are things, those are key takeaways. And so I ask you, as we end here, what is the gospel? Can you answer that question now? Can you give me that short answer even? Remember that, and I asked you this morning, if you've learned something, if you came ask, answering the question, I don't know, and now you're leaving thinking, I'm, I might know a little bit now. Have you actually given allegiance to Jesus Christ? Have you submitted to him? Have you actually given your life to him? And if you have, it's always the right time to resubmit your life to him because you've walked away. And so this is a good time to make that known. Come forward, let me know. And I will be more than happy to take your confession of fault or your confession of faith. And we as a congregation will pray with you so that you can be reunited or united for the first time with Jesus Christ and his kingdom. Let's stand and sing. Thanks for watching this video. I know what you're thinking. I don't want to miss another video from this channel. In order to avoid that, click on the red button down there, subscribe, and then click the bell icon. Not only will that alert you each time a new video is uploaded to the channel, it will also help spread the channel to other people's awareness. So, go ahead. Do it. Like right now. Click on it.